Thank you very much, everyone, dear devotees. And I offer my respectful obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, who brought us all together and who is sustaining us. And I offer my respectful obeisances to all of you, the Vaishnavas who are treading this exalted path back home, back to Godhead. Hare Krishna. Today I'll give an overview of the reason that we're doing book distribution. What is a book? We'll also talk about the ways that one may distribute books. Of course, everyone has his or her own genius of how to distribute a book. And the templates I show here are just for example. And if you follow the templates, I do guarantee that you'll have success. And that any books that you don't sell, uh, using the template I'll pay for. Because <laughs> I'm so certain of it. And I'll talk about some of the ways to organize book distribution and the four laws of book distribution. We'll also have a chance to stand up and practice the template of how to sell a Bhagavad Gita. And we have a few other ways to sell Bhagavad Gita's and other books that I'll describe through the, uh, throughout the, the seminar. So a sampradaya it literally means gift giving or complete gift giving. Some means complete and daya indicates the process of giving something that's most valuable. So it's good work if you can get it. Everyone's producing some product and offering it to the world. But what we have is inestimably valuable and actually solves all the problems of a, of a person. And it's very carefully, meticulously, delicately passed down from those who are devoted from one heart to the next. And the vibration that comes out very caringly represents the sampradaya. When we get immersed in that sound vibration that gets passed down to us, then we feel a, a transformation. And then through that transformation, we see reality and we're able to pass it on to others. This is actually the test of the sampradaya. If it's effective, then those who are receiving the vibration will also become qualified to pass it on to others. So in this case, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentioned that we require millions of gurus to go out, guru devotees who take responsibility for hearing the sound vibration of the sampradaya and passing it on to others. That's our preoccupation, that's our work. Do you like your work? Everyone said yes. Okay, good. So Advaita Acharya showed us the way, if you want to know how to distribute books or get anything else done, he showed us how to do it. And you can see the subtext underneath. What does it say? Okay. So if anybody asks you what the solution to the world's problems are, you could say? If somebody asks you, uh, how do I distribute books? You could say? Yeah, pray hard. So Sri Advaitacharya was, is an incarnation of Mahavishnu. And he calls Lord Chaitanya to come to the world. Uh, we need Krishna. We are parts and parcel of Krishna. We can't survive without him, even for a second. And we are in a precarious situation here in the material world. We need help. And Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard the loud cries of Advaita Acharya. They were so penetrating because of the quality of his prayers. When I was in San Francisco, I joined in San Francisco Temple, and there was just a renaissance of book distribution. It was really picking up 1973. And we heard in our little temple in San Francisco that somebody in Los Angeles was distributing 40 big books a day. And at first, some of the devotees said, that's impossible. They, they must be cheating somehow. 
it can't be done. But we verified it, and I remember the day I verified it, I thought, I'd like to be able to do that also. So I went to the book room, which was next door in our garage, and I got 40 books, 40 big books out, because I wanted to know what it looked like, 40 big books piled up. And I put them in a stack, and I sat there to chant my japa each morning. And I'd sit in front of the books, and I'd finish my japa there. And I was praying, uh, Krishna, please show me how to distribute 40 big books in a day. And it wasn't so long after that that I actually met the person who was doing it, took me around and showed me. It took me a while to come up to that, but at least I had the confidence and I knew what to do. So we can do anything as instruments of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We just got to want to. If you go to, in America, there's a company called Weight Watchers. Helps people lose weight. Do you have that over here? Yeah. Their, their battle cry, they put it across the, the front of the room. You got to want to. You got to want to. I like their battle cry. It works for us. The main thing is little jivas is we want something, Krishna fulfills our desire. And if we pinpoint what's best for us, and we know what we want to do, we want to serve Krishna in the best possible way. As he mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, if you give this message to others, that's the best thing you can do. You're very dear to me if you do that. It's guaranteed. You'll have pure devotional service if you do that. And then we could say, as little jivas, because we're free to think and feel, we could say, I want that. And if I develop that into a prayer, for instance, the Hare Krishna mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But behind the, the chanting is my feeling, my desire that Krishna, please engage me in your service in a specific way. This is actually the beginning of the perfecting of devotional services to desire a particular kind of service. So we can ask for it. We can pray to, to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu just as it waited Charya did. So how should we pray? Pray hard. So what happened when he prayed hard? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared, then he gave us the two aspects of the Hare Krishna movement. There's only two parts, so it's easy to pass on. You could go anywhere and restart the Hare Krishna movement because it's not complicated. Two aspects. Let's go over them. First one is Chan Hare Krishna. Okay, repeat. First one is Chan Hare Krishna. Second one is teach others. Number one. Number two. Number one. Number two. Number one. Number two. Number two. Number two. Number one. Two. One. One. Two. One. One. Two. We have to train for that. So if I wake you up tonight at 1.30 in the morning, say, what's the Hare Krishna movement? You'll say? That's right. Two easy parts. And we can then spread it all over the world. It's easily duplicatable, if that's a word even. Marketplace of the Holy Name is now open. We're open for business, everybody. We always have been. Well, not always, as we'll go into. But for us, it's wide open. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission statement is very clear. He said, every town and village. That gives us a wide scope. That's a good niche, wouldn't you say? Like the whole planet? So we can f feel free to think big, really big. For instance, there are quite a few languages on this planet. In Africa, I found out there's 2,100 languages at least. And what if it was your desire to make sure that Prabhupada's books got into every single language in Africa? Could you do it? Say yes. I mean, why not? Just say yes. And Lord Chaitanya will back you up. He writes the checks. He's the greatest capitalist, adventure capitalist. He's sitting there waiting at his desk for people to come and say, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I'd like to translate all the African languages uh, and into Prabhupada's books into all the African languages. Could I have a, a check on that one? He'll just write it right out and hand it to you. And you can spend your life doing that. And 
you can pray hard. And that's an occupation, that's an actual thing. You can put it on your immigration form when you're coming in and they say occupation. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's m mission became hidden. After he spread the Sankirtan movement all over India, he went to Jagannath Puri, converted Sarvabhom Bhacharya, Maharaj Prataparudra. He met with scholars, he met with Mayavadis, he initiated people, he got everyone chanting Hare Krishna. But after he left, after some time, the movement became hidden. Because as soon as you stop doing sadhana for one day, then the next day after that, you'll start losing scope and you'll think, well, maybe my mission is to do something else. I'm really busy right now, so maybe I'll do that. And then two days go by, then three days, and then it turns into a month, then a year, then 10 years, 20 years, and then several lifetimes go by. Maybe millions. Don't take your eye off the ball because it's important not to lose sight. Keep, keep the vision in mind of what we're doing. Uh, the movement can become hidden by little degrees of uh, change, deviation, and so forth. So listening in to the vibration that's coming from the Sampradaya, like what is my duty? What, what is the actual method and how to pass it on is important. So after it had been hidden for some time, then the great powerhouse of Bhakti, Srila Bhakti Manu Thakur, came back and revived it in 1891. Srila Bhakti Manu Thakur Ki. Yeah. He declared at Surabhikunj, the marketplace of the holy name is open again. A great relief for the world that he opened that marketplace for all of us. He also asked for help. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did, he was praying, please send somebody into my family that can extend this. Somebody very empowered. A ray of Vishnu, he called it. And he also predicted that a personality would appear that would spread the Sankirtan movement all over the world. Gorkhichor Das Babaji, meanwhile, although Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission had been hidden, uh, the pure teachings of Mahaprabhu and the Holy Name was never hidden, of course, only hidden to the vision of people in general. But there are great souls, there are always great souls, who are keeping the transcendental vibration going somewhere on the planet. Otherwise, the world would cease to be. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur spread the teachings of Shaitanya Mahaprabhu all over India. A thriving organization, the Gaudiya Mat. And you can go to South India and note that there are footprints of Mahaprabhu everywhere installed by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur so we can remember his circuitous route in South India visiting here, there, and everywhere spreading the Sankirtan movement. A momentous instruction, the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his representative is a manifestation of the internal potency of the Lord. I'm quoting Prabhupada right now from the second canto. And it is by that potency that one comes to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face. Shall I say it again? Yes. Only two people said yes, so everyone else, <laughs> please cover your ears. The order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is a manifestation of his internal potency. And it is by that potency that one comes to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face. So if we can get an order coming down through the Sampradaya, that's a rope from the spiritual world. If we grab onto that rope and we serve to the best of our ability, then that rope will pull us back home, back to Godhead. My friend Suradas likes to say, your seva will save you. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur met with his disciple, Abhai Charana, Charanaravinda, known to us as his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya of International Cipher Krishna Consciousness. And when our Prabhupada asked his guru, uh, can you give me some instruction? W what should I do? He gave this instruction, if you ever get money, print books. So let's review it. If you ever get money, buy a boat. 
you tell me true or false, he said. If you ever get money, invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> How am I doing? Not good, not very good. If you ever get money, uh, put it in a mattress. Or a lot of mattresses. No? <laughs> okay, let's hear the real version. If you ever get money? That's correct. If you ever get money, print books. So this is a thing. This is an order. This is coming from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, or Ray of Vishnu. Don't worry. If you follow the order that comes down and you t take the spirit of it, you'll come to know everything, how to do it, and also the mercy manifestation, manifested through the orders of these great souls passing down Krishna's will through the Sampradaya will manifest in your life. Srila Prabhupada said, I took it, I took up this from his mouth that he is very fond of books. And we'll notice that when Prabhupada came to America, the first property investment he made was on Beacon Street. And it was to buy a house that could hold the printing press. He purchased a printing press. Did you know that? The first property in ISKCON, there wasn't a lot of money because we used to sell Back to God Ed magazines for 15 or 25 cents. And it takes a while for that to add up. And there were no Indians. <laughs> <laughs> so the devotees worked really hard in different parts of America and put together a war chest for Prabhupada and they found this house that uh, could house the printing press. They had to reinforce the floor to hold it. And Prabhupada, previous to that, had sent out many of his disciples in New York City to apprentice to learn how to run a press. They would switch jobs, and that way they would all be acquainted with how to print. Prabhupada's focus was really on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's instruction that if you ever get money, print books. So he got money to start off a little bit and he put it immediately into a printing press and into a house where the printing press would run and he wanted it to go. As soon as he got to America, he also started up his Back to Godhead magazine. Uh, Radhadasi showed me a copy of one of the early, early Back to Godhead magazines. It's an original copy and it's stapled together. Don't, don't be afraid to start small. You know, stapled together on mimeograph. Do you even probably know what that means, mimeograph? Kucharna <laughs> Padma does, she's laughing. And, and he made it available to people, distribute knowledge on whatever surface you can print it and keep the order alive within the, in your heart. And everything else will manifest by Krishna's mercy. Srila Prabhupada spread the marketplace all over the world. Remember Bhakti Vinod Thakur revived it? Srila Prabhupada spread it everywhere, to every part of the world. It's actually a miracle that he did this. And others, even in the secular world, who observe that what Prabhupada did at his age are aghast at the accomplishments he made to spread this all over the world by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Here's his... A pamphlet that he made to sell his Bhagavatams. The pamphlet says, if you'll notice, India's message of peace and goodwill. And look at the very bottom, it says, all over the world for scientific knowledge of God. And on top it says, 60 volumes of elaborate English version. He didn't have 60 volumes of elaborate English version at that time. He had an order to make books, and he had it in his mind what he was going to do, but he's already selling all of them before he actually had them. And he says at the bottom, all over the world for scientific knowledge of God. So he was working on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission statement, which is all over the world, every town and village. That's our domain. It's been given to us. So feel free to open up and feel that you... Uh, have a wide field for operation. 60 volumes all over the world. And Prabhupada writes, I want everyone to be immersed in this inundation. Actually, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's 
words coming from the Lord himself. I want everyone to be immersed in this inundation of love of Godhead. That's the Lord's plan. Then we have Prabhupada's plan. By printing books, we can actually inject our movement into the masses of people all over the world. Do you see the similarity between the two plans? Let's review. Lord Chaitanya's plan. Who's Lord Chaitanya? Say Krishna. Okay. What's his plan? Now look at Prabhupada's plan. By printing books, we can actually inject our movement into the masses of people all over the world. It's the same plan. It's just practical to inject it into the world, all over the world. And Prabhupada says, I like this idea of distributing books and preaching. That is Lord Chaitanya's plan. They're synonymous. So as you're distributing books, as you're helping to organize the book distribution party, please know that this is Lord Chaitanya's plan. We are the Sampradaya of the book. Now, I want somebody to tell me, well, when this picture was taken. Was it with an iPhone? When was it taken approximately? Circo when? Millions, Millions or perhaps maybe billions? There's 311 trillion years in, uh, in the, uh, the life of a universe. Brahma's about 50 years old right now. It's the afternoon time in Brahma Loka. So, Prabhu, how many billion years is that? Anyway, I'm getting into details. It was taken a long time ago, probably not by an iPhone. But what, what's anachronistic about this picture? It means out of place, time-wise. Yes, Prabhu? There's a book in his hand. Where did he get that printed at the beginning of creation? Why is it there? Well, let's review why we're called the Sampradaya of the book. And that's actually a thing. Rabindra Sarup Prabhu told me about it when he was writing the foreword to my book called Our Family Business. And he said, actually, he found in several references that were known as the Sampradaya of the book. Okay, I'm going to ask you for a little participation. Are you all ready? Okay. Uh-oh, there's something that showed... Oh, thank you. Who is this? There's a, you know, cheat sheet on this, so it'll help you. Who is it? And what is he holding in his hand? Okay, you've got to say, a book. a book. A little more explosive. A book. A book. Thank you. Okay, who is this? What is he holding in his hand? Okay. Who is this? What is he kneeling before? Correct. Who is this? What is he busy writing? Correct. Here are the six Goswamis. What are they famous for and what are some of them holding in their hands? Correct. Who is this? Oh, I just noticed it. What's he posing with? Correct. Who is this? Do you notice the background, the backdrop? What's, what's back there? Okay, and who's this? What's he posing with? Correct. Do you see any pattern? Yes, there's a pattern. We distribute knowledge. Of course, the book is a delivery system for knowledge, but this is our work. This is what we do. We're the Sampradaya of the book. Now, sometimes people say, ah, well, you know, I don't know. Do people read books? And does it really make a difference? I'll make a short case for it. I could make a long case also, but the first short case I'm going to make is Thomas Paine. His book, called Common Sense, was sold in the colonies. You know where those were? <laughs> Shouldn't bring it up, right? Okay. In the colonies, <laughs> before the revolution. And to date, it's the best-selling book per capita of any other book in the history of the world. Everyone in the colonies purchased this book and they all read it, and that, according to historians, is the reason for the revolution, known as the American Revolution. Sorry to bring it up again, 
but that's, the where, that's where it started. That put, galvanized people in the colonies to rise up and break away from the British crown. Hare Krishna. Say Hare Krishna. Okay. How many people here have heard of evolution? Raise your hand. How many of you have the book called Origin of the Species? How about in your house? Two people, three. Three have it in your house. And how many of you have read it? One, two, three. But everybody knows about evolution. If you go on the street and ask anybody, they probably won't even know about the book. But if you ask them about evolution, they'll say, oh yeah, it's a fact. This is how it happens. Through mutation and it's just by chance we evolved from lower species. It's taken for granted. Any self-help book you read, by the time you get to page 12, they say, when we lived on the savanna and we were trying to get food by foraging before we evolved, that they take it for granted. This is where it comes from. It came from a book. It infiltrated society and people have this idea. It's stuck because the book was disseminated. The knowledge was disseminated and the delivery system was a book. Books last. They change society. So humans have had a love affair with books from the beginning of time. They've written on various surfaces and passed along the knowledge that they have. This is an example of a palm leaf upon which people used a stylus to impress various images and then they put it in the sun and then it shows the letters. We were copied by hand. And then Gutenberg came out. That's not the Gutenberg press, but he came out with a movable press. So as um, we heard the other day, he printed Bibles. There was a impetus to make Bibles available to the world in mass quantity. So his first printing was how much? To teach you? 180. 180 Bibles came out from the Gutenberg Press. And after that, the Royal Bible Society came out with better technology. It kept increasing. The first push for printed word was because of uh, Christians wanting to s uh, spread the Bible all over the world. And they succeeded. In fact, two years ago, three years ago, if you count out the pandemic, which I like to do, the last year didn't count, we... Uh, we went to visit the Gaudiya Mat in Calcutta, the flagship temple for Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And there we had darshan of his printing press that he imported from, wait for it, Cleveland, Ohio. It was the best technology of the time. He had it shipped over, a huge printing press, and he kept it there going all the time. And do you know where he kept it? right near the deities. It was to him worshipable. He even put the image of the printing press on his logo. And above it, he put Rag Marg, the highest path of devotional service. Books are containers, please say. Books are containers. And what do they have inside? Idea seeds. Idea seeds. So w when the books go out, those idea seeds spill out into the minds and hearts of people. And in our Krishna consciousness philosophy, we talk about the constitutional position of the jiva, which is described as what? It starts with a T. Huh? Tatasta. Tatasta means what? Or it means open to suggestion. Every jiva is open to suggestion. That's why people advertise. So if you drive down the motorway, is that how you say it? Motorway? Okay, if you drive down the motorway, you'll see billboards. Do they have billboards here? Yeah. Hadn't noticed. Okay, and they may say something like, drink Coca-Cola because it'll make you happy. <laughs> and then some little jiva, because jivas are open to suggestions, sees the sign and thinks, yeah, I think I'll try it. I'll buy a Coca-Cola. And every cell in his body is saying, don't put that stuff in here. And he goes, no, I saw it on the motorway. It said, I'll be happy if I drink Coca-Cola. Open a bottle of happiness. And little jivas everywhere are wandering the universe and they're getting such information and prods 
from various people giving ideas about what they should do or not do, and jivas follow it because that's what we do. So because everyone's open for suggestion, there's a process through which we can inculcate Krishna consciousness, inject it, as Prabhupada used the phrase, into human society and change the world. And it's not a mystery how to do it. It's not a mystery how to ex expand book distribution all over the world. It's a recipe. There is a process through which, if we follow it step by step, we will cover the earth with transcendental literature and usher in a new age of a renaissance of Krishna consciousness all over the world by focusing on this divine service. You could say Haribo. Haribo. That's right. First of all, there's four laws of book distribution. And if you follow these four laws, you'll always be successful in book distribution. And if there's any reason that you're not getting the success you want in book distribution, I guarantee you it's because you may be deficient in following one or more of these laws. Are you ready? The first law of book distribution is, your sadhana must be strong. Please say it. Let's talk about strong sadhana. It should be strict, serious, and sincere. These are three words that Prabhupada used to describe sadhana in various places, but we put it together in one place. You can make a necklace or a bracelet and put these three jewels on it. And remember, strict, serious, and sincere sadhana. If you practice strictly, seriously, and sincerely, then you'll get a taste. And when you get a taste, then you'll find absorption. And absorption is where all the advancement is in Krishna consciousness. If I live around the periphery and I'm thinking about other things uh, besides Krishna, then I'll go towards those things. They'll become absorbed into my life and me into them. But if I think about Krishna, manmana bhava mad bhakto, madhyaji mam namaskaru, then naturally, I'll go to Krishna. And when I'm with Krishna and I'm absorbed, then I have something to distribute. It's called overflow. It just pours out of me because I'm, I've, I'm swimming in it. I'm absorbed in it. I have something to offer to people. This comes from our own practice. We have to practice strictly, seriously, and sincerely. So we have to start in the morning. Your, your day starts the night before, so go to bed on time. If you go to bed on time, then you can get up in the Brahma Mohorta and practice Krishna consciousness. Japa circle is a nice idea. I'm just giving uh, various random ideas. If you can't chant Japa by yourself, get a circle of people to sit with, either on Zoom or in person, so you can really lean into your Japa and make sure that it's the best Japa you've ever chanted. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, don't try to be a great devotee, just try to be a but you should try to chant great japa. Because if you chant great japa, then you can be a good devotee. We have a, a slogan, make japa great again. We borrowed that one from a, a personality in America, of whose name I won't mention. Make japa great again, and win with the basics. Go back to basics in sadhana. You always win with basics in athletics, in uh, practicing music, in language, practice your basics over and over again and make sure you get them right. And so Bhagavad Gita, read Bhagavad Gita every day. When should you read it or how often? Correct. So Prabhupada recommended that we read at least one chapter of Bhagavad Gita a day. We call that um, Chad, chapter a day. If you get small victories, they add up to a mountain, Chirimutsumareba Yamatararu, they say in Japan, little grains of sand add up to a mountain. Please encourage the others to read this Bhagavad Gita at least one chapter every day. Bhagavad Gita as it is should be read by all of my students at least one chapter a day. How many chapters a day? One. At least one. Always say at least. At least one. Nice. So you can go to readchad.com and there are thousands of card-carrying members of Chad all over the world. It's an underground organization. Now we're just bringing it out into the light. And you can also be a one day one chapter a day devotee. You can also go to BSH page by page. It's a free app for Android or iOS, and it tells you how many pages you have to read each day in order to complete each one of Prabhupada's books within a given period of time. Would you like to finish the whole Bhagavatam in five years? Say yes. Yes. Okay, that's 
eight pages a day. How about, would you like to finish the whole Bhagavatam in one year? Say yes. yes. 41 pages a day. That's about one hour and three minutes per day only, average, to finish the whole Bhagavatam. Second law of book distribution is? Yes, and in the military they have a way of saying things succinctly and with um, vigor. And so we can say it like this, get books. Just say get books. Yes, but a little more military, you'd be kicked out of the military for that milquetoast answer there. So you say, get books, like... Get books. Okay, now we want to scare people in the other part of the Haveli that, and make them think something really heavy is going on in here. So when I say three, we say get books with great vig greater vigor. One, two, three. Get books. That's the way to do it. And if your temple president says, well, we don't have any right now, then you say... <laughs> Correct. So we've done uh, scientific studies. We've been to some of the major universities around the world, and we've done double-blind experiments, and we found out that you can't distribute books that you don't have. And so this is one of the great secrets of book distribution, is if you get books, then you can distribute them, and it's kind of magical when you get the books in your possession Make sure you arrange for them. It's a big deal to get books. You can put them in your home. You can put them in your temple. You should fill up everything with books and then plan to go out and distribute them. Get them in all the languages. We have multiple languages, so make sure you don't leave anybody out. Get all of them. Use language cards. You can use language cards to sell books. It's actually easier to sell a book to somebody that doesn't speak your language than it is to sell it to somebody who does speak your language. Do you believe me? Yes. Yeah, we have photographic evidence of that. Okay, law three is? And that's the one we always say twice, so say it again, please. When you go out and show books, little Jiva takes them. Why? Why does little Jiva take them? Because he's open to suggestions. We have our Narada Muni in the back, knows how to move it along. Okay, because little Jiva's open to suggestion, if you show the book and say, here, little Jiva, we have something for you. This is nice. It's going to make you happy. You're going to enjoy it. And go, okay. Why? Because little Jiva's open to suggestion. At any time, and you can watch this for yourself, little Jiva can change his or her mind and say yes. If you just say, nah, go ahead. Do it anyway. They say, I'm not into this. Yeah, just do it anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> You see, if you display books, people will come out of various places to see them. And all over the world, wherever you may go, just by putting books out so they're visible, you're going to find that people who didn't have a plan to become Krishna conscious, who were minding their own business, they suddenly become enthusiastic about going back home, back to Godhead. Here's another way, during the pandemic, the books became very visible through the little library system. Turns out there's tens of thousands of these little libraries and there's maps showing how to get to them. So devotees went around and they've just put books in every one of them. The more you show, the more you sell. You can knock on people's doors. Would you like to try that? Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. 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 You can knock on people's doors and they're in there wondering when Chaitanya and Nitai are going to come and save them. If you ever wonder what they're doing inside there, that's what they're doing. <laughs> Prabhupada wrote about it before he came to America. So knock on people's doors. You can go to the beach. You can go to festivals. And the fourth law of book distribution is? You must organize. Correct. You must organize because we're not running a hobby here. We're, this is serious business. We're taking over the world. We're going to inject Krishna consciousness into the, to the cities, into the colleges, into the businesses, into the hearts of every living entity on the planet. Every town and village means every language also. All these books have to be translated into every language. We have to go everywhere. So we have to organize. You can do a little bit if you stay unorganized and you'll stay at a plateau. But if you organize... You can start in a garage, like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, 
And from that little garage, you can start a multi-billion dollar enterprise. Now, Srila Prabhupada did it. If you go look at his room in Radha Dhamanar, it looks like a tiny little garage. And from there, with the little blueprint and the order of his spiritual master, he went out and started a worldwide movement. What can all of you do? What can we do together? Yes, we can conquer the whole world with Krishna consciousness, and we have to. That's our mission. So it's the seventh purpose of ISKCON that we will print books and publish magazines and so forth, and they, the, or that, the accomplishment of that will fulfill or accomplish the aforementioned six. I think I, I stumbled over that, so I'm just gonna read it with a view towards achieving aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. That's organization, Prabhupada had it in his mind that he would achieve the aforementioned purposes of ISKCON by printing and distributing books. Haribo. Haribo. If you have a calendar, you have to mark it and say, this is when we're gonna do book distribution. For a community, there are multiple activities going on, and unless you mark it down and make it a, a, a real uh, thing, then uh, you, everyone will get distracted. So you have to make focus and organize. When are we gonna all go out together? Goals are potent, my old friend Will McCoy. Goals are potent, and if you set goals, it'll bring your mind to a point of attention, and you'll be able to move towards them, and we'll, we'll walk, talk about that in a minute. Manage your inventory very carefully. This is all towards organization. Build a follow-up strategy. Here we have a School of Bhakti. I just participated in a program earlier today. These programs should be uh, supported and widely expanded because they're extremely important nurturing grounds for new people. And they go hand in hand with book distribution. When you meet a new person, they could come right into the program and uh, be taken care of. They need their own habitat to survive. They can't be thrown into the big garden of the Sunday program and say, yeah, you just try to live. They need their own place. There's also uh, Studio 108, one of the nicest programs I've ever been to. And we have Bhakti Community that we started on the West Coast and it's spreading to Sydney. It has spread to Sydney and also South America. We have it in English and Spanish. And it's very successful at bringing in new people, especially Westerners, and holding their attention so they're making advancement in bhakti. This is the Brahman, effulgence. Hiranmayena <laughs> Patrena. Uh, this is about the bhakti community, but I'm not gonna show it right now. Through book distribution, we build team spirit in the community, and what gets measured gets improved. So we have to analyze, like we were doing yesterday, we had a meeting of leaders, Sankirtan leaders from various parts of Europe, and we just looked at a few maps or charts, that is, talking about how Europe has done starting in 1981 all the way up to the present day, and how did you find that, L looking at that, Vishwambar Prabhu, in a word? It was a very good, uh, very good perspective. It was a good perspective. And when you look at the charts and you see where things are going and where they have been, then you'll have a sense of what can be done and what can be improved. What gets measured gets improved. Uh, we have some innovations to mention that flat out work. One of them is Bhadra Purnima. It was right under our nose for many, many years. It's just like the, the Gita Jayanti, but it's a perfect excuse for distributing books. Last year, in the 2020, we distributed 25,000 sets of Bhagavatams, which was a little bit over our goal of 10,000. And in 2021, we shot for 25,000, and we hit 35,000. And the five-year plan for the world, we're uh, looking at 100,000. Five-year plan, incrementally increase. So festivals and events are excellent places to present books. Motel Gita, now they're getting up to a million copies uh, placed in motels because people sit in there and they wonder what to do and they can read the Bhagavad Gita. Corporate Sankirtan has uh, uh, been expanded greatly and, it, and accounts for uh, hundreds of thousands of books going out every year from various centers. Kids Sankirtan, sweeping the world. Last night we went out with 60 kids just around the neighborhood. I took 
20 at a time to each door, and it's more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> Always sell in bunches like bananas. What you can sell one of, you can sell multiple copies. That's what it looks like, a stack of seven that you can sell all at once. They call it the Saptarishi. And they just give a brief explanation of each book, very brief, one sentence about each one. And then people uh, take these more readily than they take one book at a time. Gita Jayanti and fundraising is a huge time for book distribution. Language books, Spanish, all the different books. If you go to ethnic areas, specifically with those titles that will sell there, you'll do very well. We have Gramya Vidyadan, where we're placing sets of Bhagavatams in villages in India. We're opening it up for Africa and South America, coming up next. And we sold uh, thousands of sets of Bhagavatams, or have them uh, placed in various villages around India last year, where it makes a huge difference. It actually fortifies these villages. There's almost 800,000 villages in India, and it fortifies them f from people coming in and monkeying with their uh, original culture. They rally around the Srimad Bhagavatam. So here's a few success principles. Are you ready for these? Okay, yes. anybody who doesn't want to be successful, just cover your ears and don't watch this part. The first one is assume it can be done. When there's a gap between what you have now and what you want to achieve, there's a lot of excuses I could make and say why it can't be done. So don't do that. Assume that it can be done, and the reason to assume it can be done is because we're not the doers. Lord Chaitanya is the doer. He already said every town and village. He's empowering anybody who would like to step into the role of a servant as an instrument and who would like to express his mercy all over the world as such an instrument and vessel. So it can be done, so assume that it can be done, and then work backwards from there. So what's the first success principle? Correct. That's it. And if you work on that principle, you'll find that your whatever group, whatever team you're working with, it'll move forward very quickly. Because what holds back teams is making excuses and assuming that it can't be done. We don't do that. Second success principle. Encourage the heck out of everybody. It's an important success principle because heck gets in people and it's not pretty. It looks really bad. Did you ever get heck in you? We encourage the heck out of everybody. If you see somebody moping around or having a hard time, encourage the heck out of them. Do you know how to do it? All right, well, you need practice. The word courage comes from core, the heart. It's a French word. And we move by the situation of our heart. In fact, the word shraddha means where you place your heart. Da is an active verb, and shrud means the heart. So our movement runs on shraddha. If we have faith, if we have courage, we can move forward. We can conquer empires. But we need to have that strong feeling in our heart, uh, yoga balena, and we get it from our association. So if all you do as your occupation is go around and encourage the heck out of everybody, you're doing a great service. And this is how to build a powerful Sankirtan army. Encourage people in front of them and behind their backs also. Talk kindly about people. You can, you can uh, drop the <clears throat> disparaging news about others and just find the good aspects of their personality and their service. And it'll do, go a long way for expanding the Sankirtan movement. Next one is get into Katvanga consciousness. Sometimes people say, well, I just found out about this marathon two days ago. How can I get into this? Just remember Maharaj Katvanga only had a minute. He fought for the demigods. And then he said, they said, you want a benediction? He said, yeah. And they said, what do you want? I want to know when I'm going to die. And they looked at their Apple watches and it said, you got about 59 seconds since he asked the question. And he took full shelter of Krishna on the earth planet, and he became perfect. And therefore, Katvanga is a hero. And so you can do a lot in seven days, like Parikshit Maharaj and Shukadeva Goswami. Kurukshetra was only like 48 minutes. Katvanga, one minute. So get into Katvanga consciousness and realize that you could 
You change your life in one minute. So do it now. Don't wait for another time. And don't think, I don't have enough time. Right now is the time. Get into Jaladutta consciousness. What did it feel like for Prabhupada to step on the Jaladutta? Do you have any idea? Just go setting forth into the great unknown. This is Jaladutta consciousness following the order of your spiritual master. Thank you very much. Guru Charan Padna knows about this. She spent her youth going out into the great unknown. We worked together in the O'Hare airport back in the 1970s. And she'd go out every, day, every single day to distribute books all day long. Sometimes 12, 12 hours a day, take a cab home at night, just in time to get a little sip of hot milk and start doing it all over again after Mangalartik the next day. So Jaladut's consciousness, make life heroic, make it exciting, actually catch your own Jaladutta to whatever degree you can and be f fearless to go out and meet the world carrying the flag of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's what life's all about. Otherwise, it's just a big boring mess unless you take shelter of Lord Chaitanya. And the next success principle is how we do is more important than what we do. Please say that. Yeah, it's how we're doing it that's important, not what we're doing that's important. So if we keep that in line and remember that, then we'll be successful. We need mission-oriented or management. When NASA is building a rocket, they have a mission to shoot the rocket off. And everything they do to get ready for shooting that rocket off is develops into assets that are deliverable all over the world. And when we have a clear idea of why we're managing, this is the point, we're managing the results of our outreach. That's why we manage. Otherwise, if we manage and we don't have outreach, then we manage on a plateau. The opposite is mission-driven or mission-oriented management, which means that we put all our effort into managing the results of our outreach. And book distribution is very efficient at, uh, or it's very measurable, so that we can know how we're doing and we can work towards goals. And the results of that are what we manage. This we've been working with for a while at our center in California. By the way, I'm Vaisheshi Kadas, I come from California. And we have a center out there called ISV. It's a, a laboratory. We tinker around and experiment with various ways to do things. And one of the ways we've tinkered with is to have team-based results rather than individual results. We don't even report the individual scores. And uh, in the, when we first started doing this, it was a little controversial because when we do certain things in a certain way for a long time, everyone says, you have to do it that way. So a senior devotee called us up and said, you guys are bogus, you're doing it wrong. And we said, what are we doing wrong? He said, Prabhupada said to compete. And we said, okay, compete against us. We'll do it our way and you do it your way and then let's see who wins. And we won <laughs> by a long shot. So the team-based works very well, all for one and one for all. And here's why it works. Because when you emphasize the individuals, there's a few individuals, according to the Pareto principle, 20-80 principle, that will do better than others naturally. And the other 80% that doesn't do as well on the spectrum of just quantifiable results of book distribution, which is just one thing we're counting, then they tend not to participate as much. Because they think, I'll let those guys do it. And besides that, I'll never show up on the radar anyway, so why should I get involved, right? Does that sound familiar at all? However, if you do it as a team, and you say everything counts, everyone counts, and it's all about the team and the team score at the end, then everybody wants to lean into it and give their particular contribution that they can offer according to their capacity and their ability. And th this has worked really well. Wherever devotees have tried it, it's been very successful. 
Also, the numbers we pick for, for goals, these are basically arbitrary. Of course, we try to pick reasonable goals, but any number is going to be insignificant compared to the number of zeros you can actually add on to the end of a one. Just as the sky is unlimited, and when birds fly in the sky, they fly as high as they're able, but the sky is unlimited. So the height isn't that important, but what is important is their capacity. And what we're trying for is to increase capacity individually and collectively. And as we do it, our movement will naturally spread all over the world. The more you give, the more you grow. We're a giving movement. And we don't have to worry about taking in because the, as we give out, we hear the formula in the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, and that is that the members of the Panchatattva plunder the storehouse of love of God. You know what plunder, plundering is? It's, it's kind of alacritous. You gotta like smash stuff down. Like, uh, have you ever seen looting? Actually, the word in Bengali, lute, it's the same. Looting, people smash windows, they grab TVs, they head out. You seen this? You have that here? Yeah. You can come to America, you can engage in looting. Uh, people don't mind. Uh, looting, <laughs> no, they mind. Um, the members of Panchatapa, they broke open the storehouse of love of God and they plundered the contest, they distributed it like they were described as being madmen. They ate and distributed its contents, and what happened? It ran out. It was empty. Everyone was sad and crying when they gave it all away, right? They called the police because it was all gone. What happened? What? It increased. That's, the, that's what we have. The more we distribute the contents, the more the contents yeah, that's, they don't teach you that on the SATs. This is unique in spiritual mathematics. The more we distribute, the more we give, the more abundance comes rolling in. So this is our mood to distribute. Don't hold back, be liberal, like Lord Chaitanya and Lord Yananda. Don't tariff the heck out of everything so it slows things down. Speed it up. Take the, take the stuff off that slows us down so we can be faster and more efficient at giving out. Right, Tatikshu? Yes. Okay, there's the benefits of a global team. It builds esprit de corps all over the movement because we have one team working together that wor works locally and also globally. Esprit de corps. Uh, let me just read the definition of that. The capacity of a group's members to maintain belief in an institution or goal, particularly in the face of opposition or hardship. Esprit de corps. Isn't that nice? Globalization of book distribution, that is thinking of ourselves as one global team, also helps us to share resources and ideas. The concept that's very helpful as a basis for book distribution is, is that book distribution is high sadhana. Everyone please say, book distribution is? High sadhana. Yes, it's a way in which we go and directly experience the Lord's empowerment through us, and we also get to see how the modes of nature work. We have to get to see how our own, mind, our own minds work and we get purification from doing book distribution. And the idea is there's seven books, they're tied by ribbon, so you can't take them apart. But the devotee, in this case Gopal Champabu, gives a brief introduction, like one sentence about each book. This book shows you how to open your heart to the secrets of the universe. This book is about yoga. Have you ever heard of Bhagavad Gita? Uh, it's been read by Thoreau, Emerson, Gandhi, Tupac Shakur, the Beatles. We'd like to have your name on that list. Uh, you know, he has something, one little thing he says about each book, which only takes um, a moment or two to present. And then he asks them how much you think these seven books, comparable books, would be in a bookstore. And people say like 150, 200, 400 dollars, something like that. And he says, today, it's for $49, the whole thing. And people go, wow, I'll take it. And then they just put it on a credit card and they take home seven books at once. It's very powerful. So they have a whole library at home. We're finding we just instituted it in Japan and the devotees are finding it easier to sell seven books at one time than one book at a time. Haribo. Haribo. 
always sell in bunches like bananas. What you can sell one of, you could sell five, 10, 50, 100 at a time, rather than just one. MSF stands for Monthly Sankirtan Festival. And in our little community, our laboratory out on the West Coast of California, we uh, have most all householders, grahustas. So the boys were wondering, how can we also participate in book distribution? We're so busy, we have kids and so forth. So we came up with an idea that all the whole community would spend at least one day going out together for a few hours. Of course, at that time, we only had seven people. But we'd all go out together at that time and uh, do a little book distribution together. And from that uh, MSF, of the uh, party expanded, and now we get upwards of 500 people going out on book distribution. We have 300 kids, they go on book distribution. And from starting off with our humble goal, which the first day we went out, we, the first MSF we have, the devotees thought I was pushing too hard because we had a goal of collecting $200 and distributing about 50 books. And they came to me and said, you know, let's be reasonable. And I wrote an article and I pu published it on Dundavats about the magic of thinking big. And they read the article and they said, okay, we'll try for it. And they were successful. And since that very day, we've never missed a goal. And we kept setting incrementally higher goals for our MSFs. And now there are lots of devotees that go out. They've arranged their lives so they can go out every weekend. They never miss a weekend not just once a month, but things expand. And so the MSF has been instituted around the world in many communities where devotees are busy, but they can go out together once a month. And here's a little bit about it. Fun, organized, everyone welcome. Fun, organized, everyone welcome. Our first goal of the MSF, and this is an actual picture, is touch the pavement. I tell the devotees who come for the seminar to get a little bit of training of how to present a book that we're not going out to distribute books. We're actually only going out to prove to ourselves that we can walk out the door and not get called by our mom at the last minute asking us to come home and make a jam and butter sandwich. Because a lot of people at the last second freak out and say, I think I heard my mom calling me. I got to go home and make a jam and butter sandwich. But if they actually have the courage to walk out the door, all they have to do is touch the pavement with their foot. And they're done for the day. And in the communities we instituted this in around the world, devotees now maintain the tradition. Whenever they go out, they take a picture of themselves touching the pavement all together. After that, everything's extra. No performance necessary. If a book goes out, fine. If it doesn't, fine. We're going out because it's the right thing to do. And when you take all the pressure off, then devotees feel like, yes, I can breathe, I can do this. Of course, later on, they want more pressure and they like the goals. So it has to be a balance. And the monthly Sanctum Festival provides that. Our prime directive when we go out, leave everyone with a good impression. Please say it. When, when you do this, for instance, the other day we were on High Street, I think, I can't remember, there was one person who didn't take a book, everybody else took a book. But the one person who didn't, I made sure that I said, it was just an honor to meet you, we thank you for taking your valuable time. With everybody we meet, we endeavor to leave a good impression. And when you do that, when you're moving around the world, not just on Sankirtan, but within the community here, or anywhere else, you'll notice that life is more sublime, because you're acting good sadachar. It's sadachar. You're, you're acting nicely. Also, as we said before, preaching means giving. Everyone say. Preaching means giving. Treat people with? Respect. Offer kind? Love. Practice? Listen. Yeah, listen to people. The, when you listen, they'll appreciate you. Uh, don't be. Make people feel. Because they are. Now, here's one of the great tricks of book distribution. If you 
imagine that everybody has a little sign around their neck, around his or her neck that says, make me feel special. Close your eyes. Imagine that everyone in this room has a sign around his or her neck that says, make me feel special. Just imagine everywhere you go, everyone has a sign around their necks saying, make me feel special. And if that, and that's all you do, then you'll find an open venue everywhere you go for book distribution or anything else you want to say. The soul is special. Every person you meet is very special. They're amazing. Ascharya Vadadita Tai Vachanya. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna calls the soul Acharya Vat. It's amazing. It's special. Every soul is unique. So just do that and you'll be fine. Express gratitude. Do you guys have any gratitude? Can you express it? Thank you, Prabhupada. Thank you, such and such. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Just get in the mood of expressing gratitude. Here's our motto, always better service. I got it off the back of a bread truck, and we made it our <laughs> battle cry at ISV, always better service. We have a, a method for it. Make three improvements, at least three improvements every month. List all the places that, that there's gaps, something you want to fix. You can do it in your individual life, or you can do it for the community or on your book distribution team. If everyone has three things together they're going to fix and make better than it was last month, then everyone will want to participate and be part of your team. It's called ABS, Always Better Service. Next is, we are Krishna's instruments. Remain? <laughs> Correct. We go out for? I save one soul at a time, starting with? Myself. Yeah, save yourself first. Because we're thinking about others, how to correct them, Wor work with yourself first. Now this is a really important part. I'm gonna just take a few extra minutes on this. Rather than going out and try to convince everybody to take a book or to become Christian conscious, look for the ripe fruits. Which ones should you look for? Ripe fruits. Now a ripe fruit, for those who are good at fruit picking, it looks kind of juicy. And when you feel it, it's a little bit softer than the other ones that aren't ripe, right? Say yes. yes. Okay, and they almost come off in your hand. It's, a, it's kind of easy to pick a ripe fruit. And when you uh, come to an unripe fruit, how does it feel? It's hard. Does it, does it come off the vine very easily? Okay, so let's take a graphic look at this. You see the person on the left, he just happened to have wandered into the Rathiatra in New York. This was about 15 years ago I took this picture. And he, he just happened to be ecstatic. He didn't know what we were doing or who we were, but he was totally ready for Krishna consciousness. Can you see his countenance? Does he look like a ripe fruit? Okay, how about the guy on the right? Ripe or unripe? That's all you have to learn, is how to pick a ripe fruit. So if you go out or stay in, whatever you happen to do to distribute books, you look for the ripe fruits. And just like in police training, you know, they have these things pop up. You know, here's a robber, here's a robber, here's a good guy, don't shoot him. So you have to just look around and see who are the ripe fruits. When you, you wait for them. Okay, let's give a little quiz. So when you go to a tree, and the fruit's not ripe. It won't come off the vine. You grab onto it, and you pull as hard as you can, break the branch, and you drag it down the street and put it in the trunk of your car. Is that how you do, pick fruit? No. Say, no, Vaisheshaka oh. Das. That's wrong. So when you meet somebody who's not interested, you should follow them down the street and badger them all the way till they get to their house and then camp out in front of the house until they agree to buy a book. Is that how you would distribute a book? No. Say, no, Vaisheshika Das. That's an incorrect. We wait for the ripe fruits. We look for them. And if you do this, you'll save yourself a lot of time. It's scriptural, actually. Ishvare taradineshu balisheshu dvisatsucha. Prema maitri kripo peksha ya karoti samadhyama. Kavi Havi Yogendra says, you do this, look around and find the people who are open, and you pour in all the mercy. People aren't open, you have permission to just give them a kind glance or not and turn around and go the other direction. 
and let them be on their own. Good sadachar means then you pray for them. Like last night, we prayed for a lot of people outside their house when they didn't open their door. Start small and grow. Anywhere you start in Krishna consciousness, just like Vamandev, he was a little tiny little Brahmin, but he grew to the size of the universe. And so anything you do in Krishna consciousness, in, in this eager spirit to please Krishna, it'll expand. Corn explore. Sometimes devotees wonder about trying new ways of distributing books. Now here's a way to do it so you'll, you won't lose any momentum and uh, you won't feel like you failed. It's called Core and Explore. I got it from Charles Schwab. So the core is what you know works well and what you're used to doing, 80%. 20% of the time, experiment with other methods of distributing books. You get an idea, someone says, why don't we do this? And then two years later they say, why don't we do this? And you're still thinking about it. Try it. Experiment with it 20% of the time. And when you have a portfolio you're managing, 80% core, 20% exploratory, you're going to find expansion, but it's going to be safe enough so you don't lose your momentum. Core and explore. Goals are potent. We have to set goals for ourselves in our sadhana and for our teams as we're working. And remember where attention goes, energy flows. These are all principles we teach during the MSF. And when devotees imbibe these, they get really successful. A lot of devotees each doing a little bit is what happens when you do team spirit. Everyone's contribution gets counted and it comes out to, in, to be uh, significant. There's something for everyone in the Sankirtan movement. If you can't or don't feel like going out directly, you can always contribute and give money. Money tends to burn a hole in our pockets. We don't like big stacks of money sitting in our bank account and under our mattresses and stuff. We want to give it away, right? Say yes. yes. So you can give it to print books. And if you don't have any money under your mattress, then you can contribute by helping by cooking, by driving a car, by helping to do statistical analysis. Whatever you're good at, help to build a team. Everyone counts. And keep the bar low to start for your team so everyone knows that they don't have to perform. And then they'll be happy to participate. And the ones that have a spontaneous nature, they'll jump in and they'll do more and more and more. Sankirtan is fun and easy. Everyone say, well, actually, the, the, the wording here is supposed to be book distribution is fun and easy. So everyone repeat after me. Book distribution is fun and easy. Book distribution is fun and easy. Correct. Keep saying that. And remember that when you make it fun and easy, everyone will want to come out. There's service for everybody in the monthly Sankirtan Festival. And here's a sample MSF. You just have the morning breakfast, morning program, breakfast, Sankirtan training, a little bit. Go out, and then we come back in the afternoon, and we share stories of what, how it went. And everyone goes home happy. Collecting Sankirtan spots is very helpful. You know where they all are, and you keep a record of them. So at any given time, you can depute the devotees to go out to these various places. Keep your books organized. We recommend that you treat your book room as a sacred place, just like you do the Pujari room. In some book rooms I know, you can't wear shoes. It's just like the altar when you go in there. Pristine environment, treating the books as deities. Assign spots before you go out. The hardest thing about an MSF is troop movements. And if you have it organized ahead of time where everyone's going so no one has any trouble when they go out, then it'll be very successful. Isn't that a nice display? From the tables, they're very successful. That which law of book distribution does this fulfill? The more you show, the more you sell. Is there another one too? You get books. What about the fourth one? Organize. <laughs> okay. Uh, we pair the new devotees always with experience, with somebody who's experienced, so they can uh, keep them safe as they move around and, and encouraged. And we make a group sankalpa before we start, put our hands together and all for one, one for all, just like you do in a sports team and you go, Haribo, 
And then everyone goes out together feeling like we're together as one team. We always make sure that we have everything covered. Like last night, we were going out, and in each one of our groups, we had a designated CPA who held the credit card receipt receiving machine. We had a treasurer, someone where all the donations went. And within just about an hour and a half, we collected about 170 pounds and distributed about 60 books, uh, just from a, a large group of devotees going out. And most of them were kids. And of course, uh, communicate electronically through WhatsApp so everybody knows what's going on. We like to share as quickly as possible good news. We call this the Good News Action Broadcast. And invest. So if you need stuff, buy it. Get the best thing so everyone feels like they're being equipped properly. And don't be cheap. Buy the best thing on the market and make sure that everybody has one. And then teach everyone the great art of book distribution. And the next part, when is our break, Prabhu? Would you like to have a five minute break? Yes. <coughs> it's the flowers. Um, we'll be back here at 4.57. <laughs> and if you come back at 4.57, you could win something, okay? On your mark, get set, go. Hare Krishna. Now I'm going to teach you something extremely valuable. And that is how to distribute a book on its own merit. Also, I have a special section starting now with how to sell books to Hindus. Because if you approach in the wrong way, you may be disappointed. Ready? Yes. How to distribute to Hindus. Okay, don't hand them anything. <laughs> the second you hand them something, it's over. Because they'll feel that you're insulting them, that, and, and kind of you are, because they already know this. They already know about this. And then they're going to tell you so, as soon as you hand it to them, and, and they feel already off balance and you're off balance. So last night we met many Indian people, really nice people, and everybody knows, because I told them, don't extend anything, don't extend lollipops, no cards, no nothing. Of course, there's different ways to approach everything, as I told you before, but this is one of the ways that I guarantee you'll be successful 98.3% of the time when you approach uh, Indian doors or on the street. So don't hand them anything. Make friends first. First make friends before you tell them anything about what you're doing and ask where they're from. Because that's one of the ways you make friends with people and appreciate where they're from. Next is to use this mantra. And I suggest you have this tattooed on your arm. <laughs> Please say this, you know better than me. Yeah, you try that with your wife, or your husband, or your, your, your ashram mates, and just start off what you say. You know better than me, and you'll clear the way to communication. People will appreciate more. So when you talk to Indians, tell them you know better than me before you start, you, what you're about to say. And what I tell people before I hand them anything, so as you know better than I, there's a way in which the problems of the world are actually caused by people not having a clear idea of who they are and what the real goal of life is. And that the, 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 the solutions are all spiritual. And that India holds the key. There's the gem of all spiritual knowledge, the Bhagavad Gita, as you know better than me. You can say it more than one time. <laughs> and we tell them that we're, last night I was uh, uh, emphasizing that we're starting centers of learning for the Bhagavad Gita all over the world, not just in the UK, but also in China, in Japan, in the Middle East, and that it's the, the non-sectarian universal knowledge that can actually bring, bring peace to the world. 
And people love that. And I, I do too. It's a really good concept. So I remember, I haven't handed them anything. I'm just telling this right now. And I also mentioned how we're placing Bhagavad Gita's in hotels, schools, hospitals, and so forth, which is all true. And then I tell them it's the best non-sectarian knowledge comes from the Bhagavad Gita. And I tell them we're doing a fundraiser. I haven't handed them anything. I'm standing right in front of them on the street or the door or somewhere else. And I say, we're collecting money. And they love to hear that because they're keeping money and it's really bothering them. <laughs> they're thinking, what can I do with my money that won't bother me? And then, then when you tell them Bhagavad Gita, world peace, and they'll say, okay, I'll be right back. And they'll come back and they'll give donation. They'll feel happy. And once, you, once they give a donation, and you be very direct, what do you want? We're, we want money. Just give money. Then after they donate, then you can uh, give them a number of books. Of course, again, a disclaimer, it's not the only way. You can do Corn Explorer and try it other ways as well, as well and experiment. But in experimentation, I found this. Uh, it's good to experiment and do it the other way too because some people, when you hand them the book, you can have a really nice discussion. But I'm just saying, if you're finding that when you meet Indians, oftentimes you get into this tug of war. You hand them the book and they say, I already know this. In fact, I already know everything. My mom read the Bhagavad Gita every day to me. My grandmother memorized the Bhagavad Gita. And you can even tell them ahead of time, you already know this. Your mother read Bhagavad Gita to you every night. Your grandmother memorized Bhagavad Gita. And they go, how did you know? <laughs> this book isn't for you. That's another thing I say. It's not for you. It's for other people. You already know this. And you know better than me. Keep those mantras going. And then they'll be happy to donate to spread the knowledge all over the world. And then when you give them some books, they're so happy and they really appreciate it. So you can try this and you'll see that it works about 93.8, or did I say 98.3% of the time. I guarantee it. How to distribute books, uh, Bhagavad Gita on its own merit. L listen really carefully to this because we're gonna stand up in a minute and we're going to practice. We have Bhagavad Gita's lined up over there, and you're going to do it by uh, having a partner and, show, and distributing to your partner backwards and forwards, meaning that one will do it and then the other will do it. Okay, you ready? I'm really not convinced. Oh, all right. Here we go. First thing, and again, this is just a template. Everyone has different ways of doing it. But this is one way that I do it that's very successful. And if you try it, I guarantee you're going to sell Bhagavad Gita's wherever you go. First one is Radar. Second one is Qualify. Third is Trust the Hand. Four is Give a Nutshell Presentation. Five is Show and Tell. Six is Compliment. Seven is Humor. And eight is Engage. Ready? Here we go. Radar. You guys have them all over the place here. Radar guns, they work with some kind of beam that goes out, it hits the vehicle, and it bounces back, and it gives a reading on the meter of how fast the car is going, and they see if you're within the limit. So let me teach you how you do that. Hold up your hand. You've got a lot of power in your hand. You're part and parcel of Krishna, and you can shoot a beam like a little radar out of your hand, and when it hits somebody, you're going to get a reading back of what, keep your hand up, and you're going to get a reading back about uh, what their particular mood is, whether they're ripe fruit or unripe fruit. Okay, so now I want you to put your, point your hand at somebody in the room, not me. I can't handle all the energy. <laughs> and I'm going to do the mantra that shows you how to activate, it activates the beam. Are you ready? Hold your hand up. Point it. Hi. Did you feel it? What kind of response did you get? Was it good? That's because everyone's ripe fruits in here. But if you try it on the street, you're gonna get a number of different, now there's a scale between one and 10. I was teaching the devotees on the street this the other day. Shoot, you shoot it out there, hi, you can get like a five. And they're, they're almost, they're trying to smile, but they can't quite, a, and then they look away. 5.1, you're in business. They're just starting to get ripe. 4.9, you can let them go. They're not going to stop anyway. 
and get up in the sevens and eights, they're going to go, hi, where have you been all my life? What do you got in your bag? <laughs> Can I take all of those? That'll happen. And we're, again, we're selecting, we're not convincing. So use your radar and just say, hi, 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 hi. You watch me when I go up and down the street, I'm going to everybody, hi. Hi, 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 hi. I'm shooting them with a little ray and I'm watching their eyes and I'm waiting to make a conscious connection with them. And you can do that with living beings because they're conscious. So you look at them and they send their consciousness back and you go, huh, huh, huh? And they go, yeah, all right. It's unspoken, but there, there's, a, there's a conscious connection you can make. And when it's past five and into 5.1, you've you got a chance and you can go for it. So how do you go for it? Next thing is qualify. This kind of handshake doesn't work anymore. This was made pre-pandemic. So this is the kind of handshake. Watch this. Keshava Gokulanan came all the way over from his seat because he wanted to bump uh, hands, right? You could do it from, like, from here all the way to there, watch. I've had people come all the way across the street to get a fist bump because there's something visceral about it. You connected with another human being. This is a very powerful way. It was invented some by, by somebody just for Sankirtan. You can bump Lord Brahma and Badram Te. Bad, bump, bump. This, this is uh, one of the ways to qualify people. So you qualify people by asking a question. Here's my question. I say, I'm from California. Where are you from? Italy, I love Italy, fantastic, here you go. So I asked them a question, they gave a response, and according to their response, I hand them a book. So they don't feel like out of the blue, I just came up and said, here. They're like, why me? It's like, I don't know, I just picked you out. It's like, well, I don't want to be picked out. I want to be qualified first. Where are you from? London, fantastic, I love London. Here, take a look, we'll show you one too. So you ask the question, and then whatever they say qualifies them for having a look, and you're just gonna have a look, that's all. So the next thing, trust the hand. So the hand is a sense, one of the senses on our body, and a lot of times the body, yeah, go ahead, take a look. Still there? So the mind might say, uh, no, no, don't do it, but the hand, on the, other, on the other hand, is doing its dharma and it'll grab stuff. So you watch people, and their mind's going, nah, don't do it. The guy wants money from you. And you just hand the book to them anyway, and you watch their hand. You go, here, hand, come here. And you go, here. And then their hand grabs it. And then the, the mind and the, the guy's mind's going like, why'd you do that? Because it's like, that's what I do. I grab stuff. He put it out here. So you trust the hand. Put it in their hand. Don't be afraid to let it out of your possession into the person's hand. You can practice that. And then... Use your mantra. So here's a mantra that you can use that's very powerful. Uh, these are books on yoga, I abbreviate it, books on yoga and meditation shows you how to get free from stress. So everyone please say it. Books on yoga and meditation that show you how to get free from stress. And now there's a communication device called the question mark. It's the most powerful punctuation mark in any language. Whoever's asking the questions is leading the conversation and that's why we pepper our presentation with questions. Okay, so now you make, the, you make the statement as you're handing the book over, you say books on yoga meditation shows you how to get free from stress, and then ask them a question to hold everything in place. You've heard of stress, right? Have you heard of stress? Yes. Okay, it doesn't matter if they say yes or no, because if they say I'm not stressed, you're going to say the same thing, as if they, and if they say I am stressed. So most people, about 98% say yeah, of course I've heard of stress. I feel stressed. And then you say, really? You don't look stressed. You look spiritual. So this is not um, just undue flattery because they do look spiritual. And there's a reason for that. They are. It's instant self-realization. As soon as you tell somebody they look spiritual, they start realizing, hey, wait a minute. I forgot. I'm from the spiritual world. Try it. Say to the person next to you, you look spiritual. How do you feel? <laughs> Self-realized, right? It works anywhere. You go up to, you look spiritual, and they go, oh my God, I forgot. I'm actually from the spiritual world. So when you say, really, you don't look stressed, you look spiritual, it's like, 
how come you guys don't look stressed at all though? And they start looking around and say, actually you look spiritual. Now here's the big question. Get ready, if you don't take anything away from the seminar except for this, you're still gonna walk away ahead. Are you ready? What's your secret? Say it. What's your secret? So now this is changing the relationship. Remember I said don't be condescending? Don't be condescending to people. So they're thinking you're interjecting into my life. You're interfering because you want me to change what I'm doing. You want me to change some habit pattern I have. You want me to subscribe to some new thing. That's why people don't want to stop. So now I'm changing my relationship. Now they're the guru. I'm putting them on the Vyasasana and I'm down here going like, hey, what's your secret? You're spiritual. You tell me, what's your secret? I'm their student now. I'm not condescending, you just change the relationship. And there's a marked change right there when you say that, what's your secret? Because then they'll, they'll start thinking like, well, I have something to offer, I'm a teacher. And the people in the mode of ignorance will say, I drink and I smoke a lot of pot. People in the mode of passion will say, I, I work all day long. And then people in the mode of goodness say, I do yoga. And then some people say, I have no idea what my secret is. So then you can give them something to think about. Like, you probably just come from a good family, right? And then they'll say, no. <laughs> then I say, you're, you're just a natural then, right? And I, go, I guess so. Okay, next thing is take the book back. Now it's time for show and tell. After you've done this first part, now you take the book back and you start showing. So on the, on the back of the book, you can mention Thoreau, Emerson, Gandhi, even if it's not there, just start pointing to the back of the book and say the names. Thoreau, Gandhi, Gandhi, Emerson, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Albert Einstein, the Beatles, Tupac Shakur. That covers a wide spectrum, doesn't it? And just name drop. And then I open the book to the Sanskrit and I ask him, can you read this? 99.9% .9 of them say? No. no, and I say, I was just kidding around, just testing you. And then I say, this has been translated in English over 400 times. Out of all the translations, this is the most popular in the universities. And then I show them in the front cover, the various universities. I just show two of them, like Georgetown University and, and uh, USC. Then I start showing the pictures and I hold the book open so I can show the pictures and I show them the changing bodies. Now I say, look, we start down there and we end up here. And I ask them, where are you in this? And then they get really involved and they'll start looking, well, I think I'm right here. And I say, wow, amazing, huh? And I said, I was over there a few minutes ago and now I'm over here. We're all just passing through. And then I go to the next picture and I say, a self-realized person treats everyone with respect because he or she sees there's a spirit in everyone's heart. And then I ask them, you've heard of karma, right? And they'll say, 99% of the time you say yes, and then I say, what does it mean to you? Another question. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? What goes around comes around, and then I say, wow, what a great explanation. So you try it. I'll say, you ask me what karma means to me? Ask me. Well, you know, there's rabbits and butterflies, and the sun comes up, and it's really wild. And you say, whoa. What a great explanation. And then I say, if more people in the world thought like you, the world would be a better place to live. Everyone say that. <laughs> then I ask them, what do you do professionally? They say, I'm a civil engineer. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a dancer. I say, really, this guy used to be a civil engineer. <laughs> this, this guy used to be a Sunday school teacher. This guy used to be a dancer. And then they say, ha, ha, ha. And then that's when I hand the book back to them. And I say, we don't sell it like in a bookstore. We only ask for a donation. And now this is where a lot of devotees feel like, I, I could do everything else, but I can't ask for the donation. Do you ever feel like that? Yeah. Let me change your life for you. I'm gonna give you an infallible way to ask for a donation so you'll never feel reticent about it again. Are you ready? Here we go. Hand the book back and say, we don't need the money. But first I said, we don't, we don't sell it like in the bookstore. We only ask a donation. We don't need the money. 
The only reason we ask is when you give something in return for spiritual knowledge, it connects you to the spiritual teachers who have passed it down over many generations and it allows you to enter deeply within the knowledge. So one woman last night said, so what's the money for? And I said, it's for you, it's a penance. When you give money, then you're able to understand the book. And she said, okay. <laughs> but this is infallible because actually this is the real purpose of Dakshina. It's so the person can understand the book. And if you say it like this, just try it, even if it's Corn Explorer, you'll start, you'll start noticing that it's much easier to present like that. You're not selling a book, you're actually asking them to give something in return as a spiritual process so that they can read it. Then, if, it, then, oh, I didn't show you that part. All this, by the way, is written on a card so you can use it. If you wanna put a price, one of the ways to say it, it costs such and such for printing and shipping. Anything you give over that is a donation. For instance, if you, if you wanna throw in, they cost about $10 for printing and shipping and anything you give over that is a donation. Because sometimes people, they don't know what to give and therefore they'll say, I don't have any money. They all have money. But they just don't know what to give and they want to embarrass themselves or, or get in a, a situation where they give less than you thought they should give. So sometimes it helps if you tell them how much it uh, would be okay. And if they end up saying, well, I don't have that much, you say, just give a penny. And they'll go, I can't just give a penny. And so, no, just give a penny. And then they'll reach in and they'll give you five, 10 pounds. And then know if you come back so you can just have them in your pocket. For instance, um, they say, I already know all about this. You say, that's great. I could tell by looking at you. They say, I'm a blank. Like we met the other day, this couple came down and I showed them the book. They go, we're atheists. And I said, oh. Great, let me give you the atheist book. I took back the book I was handing him and I asked the devotee, was, is the devotee here? We were working with you. I said, give me the atheist book. And they were like, which one? <laughs> so I handed him the <laughs> science of self-realization. And the guy was so appreciative. He goes, you guys even accommodate atheists? I said, yeah, all the time, almost exclusively in fact. So the, the principle is whatever you hand the person, if they reject it out of hand because they have a certain mental construct, don't force it on them, take it back and give them another one. And then explain it in the terms that they can understand it. Like last night we met uh, several Muslims and the, like the first guy I wasn't gonna give because I came up to the door and he was almost gonna close the door with the other group and I said, oh, you know, what's going on? And he said, I'm Muslim. I said, Salam Alaikum, Alaikum Salam, Marava, Kifalaka, Alhamdulillah, al Akbar. And he was like, hey. And, you know, and then I just, I told them, we're spreading love for Allah. Allah's within everyone's heart, everyone forgot. We're supposed to pray every day and, and develop love for Allah. And he said, okay, I'll help out. So just uh, repackage it in a way that they can understand it. Are you selling this? That's a great question, I love it. And I say, we refuse to sell it. It's too valuable, we just take a donation. And they go, all right then, I'll give a donation. But you can really emphasize that first, we refuse to sell these. It's too valuable, we just take a donation. How much should I donate? We try to keep it under 100 pounds, but in your case, we're thinking about making an exception. They love that one. Because it, it keeps it fun and open. And another one we say is that, we say that uh, there's no minimum, but more importantly, there's no maximum. And then we ask them after they buy the book that do you believe in the power of prayer? And if they say, no, no I don't believe in prayer, then we say, perfect, so we give you a mantra. And then we say, uh, please repeat after me. And you say it really quick. Are you ready? Yes. Please repeat after me. Are you ready? Yes. And they go, okay. And then, Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Hare. Krishna Krishna. Krishna. Hare, Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hari Hari, then give them prasadam. There's no earthly reason not to be carrying a prasadam around everywhere you go and give it to everybody. I got lollipops in this bag, you can check me. Everywhere I have lollipops ready to hand to people and on Sankirtan it's vital, give them some prasadam afterwards. And then after they chanted the mantra, they got the book and then you can take their name if you wish. 
and uh, keep in contact with them and get them signed up for the School of Bhakti or one of the other ones. Hadi Bol, School of Bhakti. <laughs> and then thank them for taking their valuable time. Whether they gave or they didn't gave or they, they sneered at you, whatever, just be nice to them because our, our, our prime directive is leave everyone with a good impression, right? So now uh, we have a few minutes. Thank you all of you. We've really gotten filled up here, Nirakula and myself, for coming and being in your warm embrace here in this yatra. What you've created here throughout the UK and our, our experiences here will stick with us for a lifetime. And uh, tonight, I'm so touched that you all came out for this. I um, rushed through a lot of it because it's a big topic. It's an art. You don't learn to paint overnight. But it's worth taking up the art because Krishna will reciprocate with you in ways that you can't imagine. And it is something that's very dear to Prabhupada and our acharyas. And uh, please uh, organize together. You're brilliant here. And you'll have amazing hearts to help each other, work together, and do something that astounds the world. People need that now. They need to see examples of those who can rise above all the challenges of the world and work together for the highest spiritual cause. And you have it. So please go for it and uh, come to spiritual greatness uh, for the sake of helping the people of the world. And you'll be completely successful even more than you are now. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you.